September 1945. Allied occupied Vienna. While some adjusted to air raid sirens, and others to the lost light of blackouts, Diana Somerville never recovered from the absence of church bells. The war had taken the bells in London, the home she was impatient to return to, and certainly in Vienna, where she had been for the past five weeks. She'd never hear the resonant peal of the Pumarin, the booming bell cast in the 18th century and ruined several months previously at St. Stephen's Cathedral. En route to a meeting with a man named Gabriel Langer, she looked up at the interrupted cathedral. While the structure was still recognisable, its famed criss-crossed roof had been incinerated. Diana imagined it as it might have been before the war. As she passed one of the cream baroque buildings, unfelled by Luftwaffe bombs, Vida Frey, free again, was plastered in colourful attribution to the new and mostly Soviet regime in a city quartered by Allied dominance between the British, French, Americans and Russians. The city was still beautiful, despite the propaganda, scars and craters from the bombs. How had the Soviets gone from a needed ally into MI6's most imminent threat? Simon Barr had told her that the loudest voice in a time of devastation could blast through a war-torn city like cannon fire or the mournful toll of a church bell. She had been so preoccupied during her time at Bletchley Park and thereafter in this temporary city home that she hadn't paid much attention to politics. Certainly not with the depth Simon did in his clandestine world. He felt that allowing communists to assume any power was as large a threat as the war they had just survived, if in a different way. Diana strode down the sunny streets, occasionally squinting to blur the faces of the buildings, so at least for a second her vantage was spared the damage caused by the bombs dropped by the Allies, who now promised the city's free and bright future and reconstruction. Vienna was not quite the city she once had imagined exploring, with cranes modernising the otherwise historic skyline and the pedestrian thoroughfares of the Graben and Kartnerstrasse, marred by blockades that kept the rubble from tumbling onto the pedestrians. She'd imagined looping arms with her husband, Brent, and peering up at steeples, not waiting for the next directive from her friend, and wartime colleague, MI6 agent Simon Barr. Simon said a new war was building, one that would require intelligence and the decryption skills she had honed during her work at Bletchley Park and the Government Code and Cipher School. But mostly he required her intuition and ability to read hidden messages. From the position of a column in a Christopher Wren church, to the subtle interruption of a Mozart piece when her ears were attuned to unusual activity in a Luftwaffe flight plan intercepted by radio waves. His pursuit of a Soviet agent named Eternity led Simon to believe an association existed between churches in Vienna and in London and the spread of the man's communist influence. Simon needed to find Eternity. The man was rumoured to possess a file containing information that could prolong the war, or catapult the new war he spoke of into a certainty. A file that men would kill for. When Diana had protested that the war was over, Simon merely gave her a look she recognised from dozens of times when she asked a question about chess he was surprised she didn't know. No one, of course, was better suited to search for the concealed clues a church might hold than Diana Somerville, nay Foyle. She loved churches, especially those designed by Sir Christopher Wren. And as to recognising the pattern of eternity, the man used a signature, the mathematic symbol for infinity. 
Simon chose the code name when the foreign agent's activity seemed to involve churches, the eternal house of God on earth.